Hello, it's Michael E. Gerber speaking to you again from Carlsbad, California, the land that God created just for you and just for me. I'm thrilled to be here again with you with Awakening the Entrepreneur Within. Today, we have an extraordinary message for you. We call it from a pickup truck to a 747, and it's the life and times of Brian Scudamore the most extraordinary entrepreneur you'd ever want to meet, started his company, this great growing enterprise, in a pickup truck picking up junk. Now, how in the world does somebody go from a pickup truck picking up junk to become one of the most extraordinary young and profoundly successful entrepreneurs on the planet? That's what you're going to hear today. But mostly what you're going to hear today is ordinary to exceptional. Because the story of Brian Scudamore's life, and it's the story of the companies he's founded to truly take this amazing vision he's had out to the world. Take that in from the ordinary to the exceptional, from the ordinary to the exceptional, the life and times of Brian Scudamore. Brian, thank you for being here with us today. Always nice being with you, Michael, and honored to be included in your, in your show. Well, thank you, Brian. So, Brian, I want to hold up this most extraordinary thing you've actually done, and that's to write a book. And it's not just any book. In fact, I just read it yesterday from start to finish. It's not just any book. You might say it's the book of the life and times of Brian Scudamore, and 1-800-GOT-JUNK. I just want you to share with everybody here what propelled you to write the book and what was it like actually going back when you started and bringing it forward to where you are today? Yeah, I wrote the book to inspire, to inspire others. I have loved every single day of what I've been building with 1-800-GOT-JUNK and O2E Brands, all four of our home service companies. It has been such a remarkable journey for me, the learning, the failures, the, the title is WTF. And I didn't have a title when I set out to write a book. I had a title after the book was written. And my co-author, Roy Williams, the wizard of ads, he told me that would happen. He said, it'll be like magic, Brian, don't worry about the title, let's write the book and the title will present itself. So my reason for writing the book was to inspire others it doesn't matter if somebody does something with us in one of our brands or does something on their own. If they get a lesson, an inspiration, a nugget out of that book, I think you have the ability with the book to change people's lives. And you know that better than anyone. Your book, The E-Myth Revisited, I read twice in one sitting because it made such a massive impact. And as a result, uh, of course, you've got that book in your hands because I wrote that book and, and you're in it. So uh, thank you, Michael. Well, thank you, Brian. So I read the book and something stuck out in the book. You started out your business um, propelled because you saw somebody else with a sign on his truck while you were driving through McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And the guy was obviously a junk guy. And you said to yourself, wow, I could do that. And I could pay my way through college while I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what I heard. And then you began to pick up junk. Well, how did you learn how to pick up junk. So it was a founder's story. For me, somebody starts with an idea, they plant a seed, and you just don't really know that day, day when you put the seed in the soil, what it will become. Will it grow into something that, that prospers? Will it die on the vine at, a, at an early age? You just don't know. And so my journey of finding that pickup truck, being inspired by that junk guy, Mark's Hauling, I remember the company name, and I said, I can do that. I didn't even say I can do that better. I just said, I can do that. <laughs> I, bought a, I bought a pickup truck, $700. I formed the company, The Rubbish Boys. Even though it was just me, I had a name for uh, a vision for something bigger, The Rubbish Boys. I had to get out there and find employees. I hired friends and I figured it out as I went. But I think it wasn't really until 1995, about five, six years into the business when I came across the, e across the EMIF that I actually said, okay, I'm learning, I'm figuring stuff out, but I'm repeating my mistakes. I need to document all my best practices. 
systematize my business. So I didn't have to work on the business or sorry, I didn't have to work in the business. I could work on it and really scale and build something. So how did I learn? I learned just by figuring it out until I met teachers like you. That's wonderful. And, and, but it's so important. And it's so important because when you say I learned by figuring it out, you're just motivated to get started and you just did. Mm -hmm. And what was your first job? How did you get that first job? The first picking up junk job that you got with your new truck, which was an old truck. Right. What was that? Do you remember? Yeah, it was an old truck. It was a $700 truck. It shouldn't have probably even been on the road. I mean, it was junk itself. So how ironic. But there I was. I put an ad in a classified newspaper back in the day when those existed. And I put a little tiny ad. I think it cost me about 50 bucks. Ran it for the week. And the first day, I got a call. I got three calls saying, okay, I've got junk. Can you come pick it up? How much do you charge? I didn't know how much I charged. I just looked at other ads and figured out, okay, they're charging you know, $80 a truckload. I guess that's what I should charge. And you figure things out over time and you, that's you, learn, you learn from doing. Yeah, you, you figure things out over time. So you understand, every one of you who are listening to us right now, anybody, anybody in the world could have started the way Brian started. And I'm saying everybody could start like Brian started with a little ad in the newspaper or wherever in social media you might run that little ad to begin to make a living doing something you didn't know anything about. But step by step by step, you begin to learn something. You learn something from what you did. You learn something what you failed to do. You learn by your mistakes. You learn by your errors. And that's what that book is all about. It's about willing to fail. What the? It's about, <laughs> it's about learning by failing. And effectively, that's what Brian did. And it's so amazing when you hear about it because, Brian, today, your combined companies are producing what in revenue? We are $365 million in revenue across three countries, Canada, the United States, and Australia. Think about that. So Brian's on his way to becoming a billion-dollar company. Mm -hmm. Brian's on his way to doing something that most people could absolutely can't believe is possible to do. But Brian's done it. But what Brian also says in his book, I'm just an ordinary guy. Now, understand Brian says that, and I don't believe that. I don't believe <laughs> Brian is just an ordinary guy. But Brian, when you say I'm just an ordinary guy, what do you mean by that? I, I'm a guy who wears jeans every day. I wear the same black and white uh, you know, clothes generally, black or white t-shirts. You take your pick. I'm colorblind. So really it's about convenience and ease. I drive a little, pick up pick, uh, a little pickup truck. It's not a beat up one. It's a brand new Toyota truck. But I think I'm an ordinary guy because all I realized I've been able to do in my life is dream up big possibilities, planting the seed and inspiring others to go plant their own seeds. So when I say I'm an ordinary guy, I'm a high school dropout. I talked my way into college. I went to a bunch of colleges and then ultimately dropped out. So I was learning more about business by, by running a business more than I was studying in school. I remember the day I sat down and said to my dad, who's a liver transplant surgeon, a guy who's taken academia to, the, to its, its highest point. And I told him, dad, I got good news for you. I've, I've dropped out of university. I'm going to become a full-time junk man. And he said to me, how, how is that good news? And I said, I'm learning so much about business by running one. I found a better education model for myself. So when I say I'm an ordinary guy, I, yeah, I but what did your dad? Guy. What did your dad say when you said that to him? Oh, I mean, my dad was thinking, you know, is this kid smoking the hope dope? Like, what is he <laughs> thinking that he's going to build this junk removal company? What, who, who, what kind of father is going to be proud of someone for building a junk removal business? But he did not see what I saw. You talk in your books and in your teachings about creating a company story. I had a company story, what I call my painted picture that I created eight years into the business that said we would be on the Oprah Winfrey show. We'd be the FedEx of junk removal. We'd be in the top 30 metros in North America. All crazy ideas to anyone but me. I believe them. I recruited people 
and I made every one of those things come true. So your painted picture is really what we talk about when we talk about your dream, your vision, your purpose, mm -hmm. and your mission. Mm -hmm. what we talk about in the dreaming room. And it was astonishing to me as I was reading your book um, and how our path and your path were almost identical, though we hadn't really even spoken about it. Now, you read, you read my book. And of course, my first book, that E-Myth Revisited book, um, had a major impact on the way you thought. But you really didn't read all the rest of the work that I've done. We've actually published now, written, published, 31 books. Wow. Books on every aspect of what it is you speak about so eloquently mm -hmm. in your story in WTF. And so it was absolutely amazing to me as I was reading it and realizing that you were doing what I was writing about. Now understand you were doing what I was writing about, but we weren't speaking about it. Well, you know you, how remarkable that is. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I you know, I, I want to give you credit because you laid out such a brilliant book that charted the course for entrepreneurs. I mean, your, your book has sold millions and it's got a cult following and we buy them by the thousands to give away to our franchise owners and people that come into our head office, the junction for a tour. We give them out to people because it was such a brilliant is such a brilliant piece of work that's prescriptive, that tells someone how to do it. And so you laid it out so clearly that me getting out there and doing it, even before we met, the recipe was so clear that how could I not get there? How could I not succeed? <laughs> and uh, you've laid a great path for many, many, many people. Well, thank you for that. And, but what I was really speaking to was that each and every time I wrote a new book, I added a dimension to what I wrote originally in the E-Myth Revisited. Mm -hmm. um, why most small businesses don't work and what to do about it. And so we went on to E-Myth Mastery and we went on to the most successful small business in the world. Mm -hmm. and we went on to Beyond the E-Myth and now to the book that we've actually written and are gonna provide as a gift to every single person listening to us today, making it on your own in America or wherever you happen to live, a journey toward radical self-employment, which is effectively, Brian, what you were exemplar of. You were radically self-employed when you started driving that truck and you didn't even know it. Very true. And that's my passion. When you talk about someone's dream and mission and vision and all that sort of great stuff, nothing motivates me more in this world than, than my family, uh, other than my family, than building things with great people. We always talk about at O2E Brands, Ordinary to Exceptional, that we are building something much bigger and better together, something bigger than any one of us would have ever chosen to build alone. We love doing things together with great people and nothing inspires me more than empowering others to do great things. Uh, I think you and I are similar in different ways. While you've written 31 books, you've also inspired others to build great things. My vision is no different. It's just in the, the translation of, of that vision, we give people a franchise model, a platform, a springboard, if you will, on how to build something great. And it's never been about the money, it's been about doing fun things, challenging, worthwhile things with amazing uh, human beings. So, and that, that really came through in your book, Brian. And I'm gonna hold it up again, just because I wanna make sure that everybody sees it and everybody gets it. This book is truly a remarkable book because it tells something that is unlikely for people to understand. On the one hand, Brian speaks about systems, turnkey systems, a turnkey capability to produce an absolutely predictable result. On the other hand, Brian talks about doing amazing things, amazing things that aren't necessarily the system. They're innovation. They're seeing an opportunity, as Brian did when he set out with his picture and when he talked about Oprah and when he talked about um, the leading brand in the world and when he talked about all of these impossible things that he set out to achieve. He actually achieved them. 
Tell the story about Oprah, Brian. Yeah, it was it was something where it was in our painted picture. I knew it would happen. I didn't know how. And for months and months, I mean, it was at least a year we were chasing, trying to get on the Oprah Winfrey show. And we had a fellow named Tyler Wright, who's written about in the book, who was our first PR hire. And he used to look at the wall that we had, a can you imagine wall that had all these big, bold dreams of things we wanted to make happen. And one of those things was being featured on the Oprah Winfrey show. And it had my name below it, my commitment that I could see the vision, it was gonna happen. And Tyler was pitching and one day he stood up in our office in an open office environment and said, I did it, I did it. And people are just wondering what is going on with this lunatic. And you then realize, he said, we got it. We're on, we're gonna be on Oprah. And he landed this a massive life-changing, business-changing media hit for us. And what it really taught me was you can give an idea, a seedling again, to someone who has zero experience with pitching PR, yet they believe in your beliefs, they align with your values, they align with your vision of what's possible, and they set out to make it happen. And so getting on Oprah, I remember that four and a half minutes of fame, being on stage in Chicago, Harpo Studios, big hug uh, that I got to give Oprah at the end, and phenomenal moment that changed the course of our business, (laughs) but it was something we envisioned we would do and we put a plan together and persisted to make it happen. I mean, you you had that vision um, long before you ever had the possibility of realizing it. Long you, before. You, you saw this great growing company long before you were this great growing company. Mm-hmm. So your imagination stimulated and inspired outcomes that nobody could have believed possible. Mm-hmm. nor had you ever achieved anything of those monumental sizes. So it's extraordinary when you think about that, as you were sitting there in your cabin, envisioning what you're about to set out to do, as you made the choice, in fact, to start your company all over again, to literally fire everybody in your company and start anew, Tell everybody that story. It's just absolutely brilliant. Yeah, it, you know, it was one of the biggest leadership moments of my entire 29-year business career. I had 11 employees, the entire company, about a half a million in revenue, five trucks. And I realized I wasn't having fun. What year was that? That was 1994. And how long in the business had you been? I'd been five years. Got it. So I had something that many would be proud of, a half a million dollar business. I was making money. I just bought a house at 24 years old, but I wasn't happy. I wasn't fulfilled. I was not enjoying my day-to-day work. So 11, let's call it nine bad apples. One spoils the whole bunch. I had 11 employees and I decided the only way to, to get towards a vision, to get towards building a, an exceptional business was to get rid of everybody and to start again. So I made a tough decision brought everyone in for a morning meeting. And this morning meeting, like many we had, uh, was a little bit different because I said, guys, I, I've let you down as your leader. I'm parting ways. I failed you. I've not given you the love and support you've needed to be successful. Maybe I didn't even hire the right people to begin with. Whatever the issue is, it's a combination of things that I don't think I have the leadership capability to solve. And I'm going to start again. And I think they appreciated my transparency, my honesty, my willingness to take accountability for the mistake. And I I cleaned house, so to speak, and I started again and going from five trucks down to one person who can't drive all five at the same time. You've got to scale back your business and retool and rebuild. And it was a year after that that I read the e-myth that got me some direction and support and some hope, if you will, to build it in a better way, to build it with a foundation of systems, to take my best practices and, and redo things. And it, it's phenomenal because we really talk about as a company, 1-800-GOT-JUNK or any of our brands, that this company is all about people, finding the right people and treating them right. That philosophy would not have happened if I hadn't made the massive WTF uh, in, in many definitions Uh, had the moment of getting rid of my entire team and starting again, it led to a positive outcome for everybody. Well, what's extraordinary about it um, is that you didn't quit. 
you just started anew. Mm -hmm. But you started anew realizing that something serious was missing in the company and it wasn't about them, it was about you. Mm -hmm. And so you started anew to discover and create a new path for yourself. Mm -hmm. And the new path obviously wasn't clear to you at that point, but you knew that you couldn't continue doing it the way you were doing it. So how did day one differentiate itself in what I'm going to call new co after you've gotten rid of everybody and you're starting anew, how was that different from the day before? It was very stressful, the new co, but stressful in a different way. If it was to be, it was up to me. It was up to me to make the change for the positive. It was up to me to have a new direction of what type of people I brought in. I decided that day when I got rid of all my employees that I would never make the same mistake again. Now, of course, I'm human and I've mishired, but not nearly to the same degree. I've been very, very careful, slow to hire, quick to fire, find the right people, treat them right. So that next day was me going, okay, I'm going to make sure that I have someone in those trucks that I enjoy, that I'd love to have a beer with, that I find interesting, interested. And I built a whole new culture, a culture of friends that we treated each other like family. And that's still the culture today because we built this platform based on the right people for me, the right people for our company. And it was game changing. I think most companies out there, most entrepreneurs compromise on the people they bring into their organization. And I think that's a very slippery slope, dangerous thing. All the company has is its people, and you've got to really work towards understanding who are the right people for your company. But it's not all a company has, and that's the point I was going to make. What you mm -hmm. started over with is what you came to call PIPE, P-I-P-E. Mm -hmm. Right. And every single one in your company had to possess these four very specific ingredients within themselves you couldn't give it to them. They had to possess it. And you call them passion, integrity, professionalism, and empathy. Mm -hmm. And so pipe became the new ingredient in Nuco mm -hmm. that effectively forced you to ask the question earnestly, who is this guy? Who is this mm -hmm. person? Is this mm -hmm. somebody who's truly alive and awake to the possibility of doing something beyond belief? Do they have the passion? Do they have the integrity? Do they have the professionalism? Do they have the empathy? Are they truly committed to growth? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We came up with a formula, less of a formula, a recipe. And it was, as you said, those ingredients had to be within those people if they were to fit. They weren't things they could learn. They couldn't change and become those things. They had to already be a part of that person. And we got that from our own group of values where we went to, my parents had that cabin. We went there as a small leadership team. We took 400 post-it notes and everybody wrote out words that described our values, not who we wanted to be, but who we already were. We put them all over these big windows at the, the seaside and grouped them into categories. And every single word, for the most part, grouped into one of four categories, passion, integrity, professionalism, and empathy. And what that showed us, that highlighted for us that the words, the values that matter most to us are those four things. Let's make sure we're clear on what we're looking for and only find people that possess those four values. If they're missing one, if they're missing passion, sorry, it's not a fit. If they're missing integrity, again, it's not a fit. So we became very, very careful of who we recruited and still do into the family. But I imagine you had to have a way to do that. You just didn't um, make it up. When you sat down with somebody, you had to have a way to determine that they had passion, that they had integrity, that they had professionalism, that they had empathy, that these were core values that lived within them, even if they didn't know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had to storytell around it. We had to tell stories about what is passion and let's, show how people in our organizations have demonstrated passion 
our franchise partners and how they've grown in a way where they're so passionate about their goals and their growth and their people. We pick a value, we storytell around it, we make sure everybody's clear on what that value is and means, and then we teach people how to look for those values. You will hear someone around this company, around the, the junction, very often you'll hear someone, it's always a different person going, oh, that decision wasn't very pipe. They're telling us that those are our standards, that's our North Star, and we should hold ourselves accountable to what we believe is most important. And we'll often look at ourselves as leaders and say, you know what, you're right, that falls on me. That wasn't very pipe. Here's what was missing. Here's what we've learned. Here's the mistake we've made and what we do differently next time. It's wonderful. And it's extraordinary because I imagine that system became a lifeline to every single one of you. You truly recognized when it wasn't there and you truly recognized when it was. So you recognized also the way you needed to be in order to, um, to um, stimulate and inspire um, the uh, imagination of your people um, to reach out, to grow, to be something more than everybody was. And that is the hallmark of what you've done, Brian. And it's just exquisite to me. Now, I understand there's somebody who has a question they want to ask. So please, let's hear the question and let's have you answer it. Awesome. Can't hear you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the, the question was, did I quit college because I didn't like college? What ins inspired me to, to do junk removal? So junk removal came first. I found that truck as a way to pay for college. And I got out there and I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a business that's going to fund my way through college. Well, it did. But what inspired me to drop out was I was learning much more about running a business, more so than studying in school. And that's when I had that chat with my father. Uh, the reason I quit college is, you know what, I am so ADD, it's hard to sit still for an hour from class to class to class. I love to learn. I happen not to be a great reader. I happen not to be somebody who um, learns except from asking questions, meeting people, asking questions, and that's really been the key for me. You learn by doing. I learn by doing, and I learn by sitting down with doers and asking them questions about how they've done. Um, you know, sitting down in the classroom and hearing from a marketing professor who's never marketed a thing in, in his or her life, that was a challenge. <laughs> I got it. Another question. <laughs> Another no college person. Yeah. Like Steve Jobs, like Bill Gates, like Brian Scudamore. Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, you know, there's a bunch of people. And, you know, so I think what entrepreneurs, the statement they're making that I don't think they're trying to make by quitting college, by not completing, I think what they're saying is they found better ways to learn. I love learning. And school is fantastic. If you want to be a lawyer, if you want to be a doctor, if you want to get your real estate license, I mean, there's things you have to go to school for. I think entrepreneurship is not one you go to school for. I think you go to the school of hard knocks. I think you go to the school of learning on the streets. It just isn't something that I think you can study in university or college. So when you see a pattern of entrepreneurs, people that have done well, that have dropped out, it doesn't surprise me. It never has. And that's great, Brian, and it leads into the story we're going to share in the last half hour of our time together, and that's the creation of Radical You. Um, and Radical You is the entrepreneurial development school of all time because it's created around a curriculum by creating, actively creating a company of one and growing it to a company of 1,000. At Radical You, we teach people to do what Brian Scudamore has done. So we're going to talk more about that. We're going to take a break and come back and engage in conversation about that.
Thank you, Brian. Be back shortly. Awesome. Hello, it's Michael E. Gerber speaking to you from Carlsbad, California, the land that God created just for you and just for me. And I've got a gift for you. Yes, it's a truly stunning gift. Here at the age of 82, I sat down with my wife's determination that I discover how to share our greatest breakthrough with every single human being on the planet. And it's a free book. And the book is entitled, Making It On Your Own in America or Wherever You Happen to Live, A Journey Toward Radical Self-Employment. It's yours. You can get it now. All you got to do is look down here and say, send it to me, Michael. I want it. I want it now. And you got it. See you soon. Bye-bye. Wonderful. Welcome back. We're here with Brian Scudamore and talking about making it on your own in America or wherever you happen to live, a journey toward radical self-employment. It's a process. And when Brian says you don't get that at school, I agree with him completely. You don't get that at school. You go to school where you live and you begin it like Brian did, a sole proprietor, just you, just there, all on your own, doing something while you're making a living doing it and learning how to grow it to something beyond belief. That's something everybody can do, and that's why we created Radical You. So, Brian, I'd like to also get into the conversation more completely about your first experiences as you began. You jumped from one truck um, after five years um, with 11 people, got rid of everybody, started all over again. You didn't become a franchise immediately. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the path from there to when you began to franchise in earnest. Yeah, great question. So what I did is I started to, I'd, I'd read the E-Myth Revisited and I got the whole set your business up like, up like a franchise, even if you don't ever anticipate you will franchise because... Say that again. That's really, really important for all of you. <laughs> set your, your business, up, business as up as a franchise, even if you never think that you'll actually franchise because franchising succeeds at a much greater level than a non-franchise business because of systems, the systematization that's behind that business format franchise. So what I did is I, I really said, okay, how do I document every process in my business? How do you load the trucks? How do you find new staff? How do you interview those, those new staff to make sure they fit with your values? How do you price jobs? How do you market the business? Everything became a one page best practice. And I put it together in a binder and the business started to look, feel and act so much like a franchise in terms of a one size fits all, consistency, the brand, the professionalism, that I said, you know what? I know this wasn't the intention to franchise, but maybe I should look at that as a model for growth. And so I started approaching franchise mentors, a whole ton of different people, about a dozen people who every single person that I approached, and there were people from McDonald's, people from all sorts of franchise backgrounds that said, this cannot be franchised. <laughs> they, you know what? And I, and I had to believe them because I thought these are experts. But one thing that I did was with every single person that said no, I said, why not? Why can't it be franchised? What's missing? What would make it franchisable? So curiosity got me to answer those questions, retool the model. And when I went back to a few of them to say, well, what do you think now? Now that we have a call center, now that we want to do the booking and dispatch so that franchise partners can focus on pounding the pavement and dry, driving sales, working on the business, not in it, would those things make a difference? And people started to look at this FedEx, a junk removal model and said, you know what, Brian, I know I told you it can't be done. I now think it can. And that gave us permission. It gave us hope. And off we went to create the FedEx, a junk removal, 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And your first franchise was where? First franchise was in Toronto. So thousands of miles away from Vancouver on the West Coast of Canada, where we're based, I had a, a fellow named Paul Guy, I talked to talk about him in WTF, the book. 
and he was my operations manager. We worked together, we butted heads because we, we never agreed on anything. And he was a smart guy, but it became a challenge. And I remember one day he was sitting back in the days when we had private offices. Now it's all a big open office environment. He was in his private office and I went in and had a chat with him and we disagreed. And I said, ah, oh, this is difficult. I don't think this is working out. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I think you should leave. And he said, when do you want me to leave? And I said, how about now? And uh, he said, okay. And he never left. <laughs> and three, three days later, I came back in and I said, I got an idea. First of all, it's weird that you're still, He's still here. sitting there. And I said, and I'm sure he went home at night to, to <laughs> shower and eat and so on. But I said, listen, Paul, you go back and forth to Toronto every couple of weeks to visit your girlfriend, who's now his wife. I said, why don't you consider taking the first franchise? Why don't you start the first 1-800-GOT-JUNK? And his eyes lit up. They sparkled. We connected on possibility. And it just blew my mind years later to think how he's become one of my closest friends, one of my biggest supporters, and he laid the foundation for this business to become successful for everyone else. How you can take someone who's an adversary, who you're butting heads, locking, locking horns like two rams on top of a hill, yet somehow Paul and I connected on possibility. And from that day on, things have been radically different. And what was it that... Um, cause the knocking heads and suddenly realizing he was somebody, somebody that was completely different than that. What was the, what happened? Yeah. I wonder if I, I mean, part of it was maturity. I'm 48 now. I was about 28 then. I thought I knew everything then. I clearly didn't and never will. And I think part of it was his opinion, but the style in which he shared his opinion, I found kind of confrontational. And I felt like he, maybe he didn't really have my back. But when I realized we aligned and, and joined forces based on a common vision, that's when that possibility lit up. And we just got excited and fired up about what the future could look like. And mm -hmm. we wanted to do this together. And we did. And it somehow changed. I mean, I don't know if at the time I got so excited because I wanted him out of my office and, and this was the <laughs> only way to do it. But man, it, it send worked him out. Thousands of miles away. Exactly. Get as far away as, from me as you yeah, can right. and go run a business far away. But you know what? It's been amazing. He did a million in revenue in his first full calendar year with 1 800 Got Junk. I did wow. a million after eight years. So here I am, a competitive guy. He goes out and does it eight times as quickly as I did. And that's part of what made me go, wow, we are on to something. We've got systems and processes that are now starting to scale. And he went back and back to Toronto and used the systems that you'd created? Yeah, he used the system. He, he helped to tweak the systems and make them better. He has been a big supporter of systems. And uh, he led the way. Everyone else who came in said, I want to be like Paul Guy. And it's been fantastic to have someone who was a part of creating some systems that others then scaled upon. And I think that taught us that as a franchisor, we need to listen to our franchise partners. We need to ask them questions. We need to encourage them that when they find a better way, how do we document that? How do we share that? How do we make sure that people are following the same recipe that others have deemed to be very successful? So that's an important question. Um, how many franchise partners do you have now? We have about 250 franchise partners across 1-800-GOT-JUNK, WOW and Day Painting, You Move Me, and Shack Shine. Four very different home service business under, under the O2E brand's umbrella. But those four businesses all have something in common. We go into homes, we provide a WOW customer experience, and we follow systems and processes in which to scale, grow, and be successful. Do every one of your 250 franchisees use the same systems? They would use similar systems for, say, recruiting. They would use different systems for operating Shack Shine, which is a window washing, power washing, gutter cleaning business. The business is very different than junk removal. They no, might course, use... But, but what I mean is, do all your Shack Shine franchise, hmm. franchisees use the same Shack Shine system? Do all the 1-800-GOT-JUNK 
franchisees use the same 1-800-GOT-JUNK mm -hmm. system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the answer is most of the time. We, they are human beings. They live in different regions of the countries and sometimes they wanna do it their own way as a franchise partner might. But when a franchise partner comes into our system across any brand and a new franchise candidate is coming in and says, so give me some advice here. What's the most important thing I need to know about Shack Shine or 1-800-GOT-JUNK? And they're always told by any franchise partner they talk to, follow the system. Even if that franchise partner who's given the advice that says follow the system didn't follow the system themselves because they thought they could find a better way, they yeah. understand this concept that the system is created by all of us. It's the collective. It's a, a system that is getting bigger, better, and, and works well together. So why wouldn't you follow it? And so that's the advice that's always given, and we hope that it's always taken. I'd say most of the time is my answer. So let me ask a question about your phone number, mm -hmm. your brand name, 1-800-GOT-JUNK. How did you get that number? And why did you decide to centralize your client acquisition through that number for all your franchises? I'll start with the, the latter half of the question. We decided to centralize because we knew that if we could get people following systems and not having to do everything so that they could work on their business, not in it. If there were things we could take away from our franchise partners, like the booking and dispatch of jobs, the talking to customers and really sorting out any logistical issues, whatever someone might have, we could allow them to focus on pounding the pavement, driving sales and building great teams of people and making them better. So the centralized approach turned out to be the absolute right way for us. Now, one phone number, one simple call center, we have about 400 plus people in our head offices and uh, the call center has been key. So how did we get the phone number? 1-800-GOT-JUNK came out of an inspiration from the Got Milk campaign. There was a big advertising campaign about 20 so years ago and I said, ah, oh, what about 1-800-GOT-JUNK? Instead of the local phone number we had, 738 junk, I thought there's got to be something that is more impactful that could be part of an 800 number. So we came up with this 1 800 got junk. Of course, I make the phone call. I'm all excited that we've got this amazing idea, and the phone number is not available in my area. So I call again. I get other people to call. I call 1 888 got junk, my second choice for an 800 number. The guy on the other end of the line said he wanted $100,000 for it. My little startup <laughs> couldn't afford that. So that ended that call. I proceeded to make phone call after phone call from different areas of the United States till someone finally answered. And it was the Department of Transportation in Idaho. The government owned my phone number. What were the <laughs> odds of me getting this phone number? Probably close to zero. But I did something. And I know, Michael, you, you understand this is sometimes putting vision ahead of anything else. Early in the stage when I was making a few phone calls, I decided to hire a design company called Drive Design, $2,000. They created my logo exactly the way it looks, feels, and, and acts today. We had this 1-800-GOT-JUNK brand created before I had the 1-800-GOT-JUNK phone number. After 59 no's, I finally got a yes from the Department of Transportation from their phone room. And Michael was his name. He finally said, you called me three times, dude. I don't know why you want this phone number, but clearly it's more important to you than it is to me. Here you go. And uh, two days later, he was no longer with the company. I don't know what happened, but we got the phone number and the rest is history. How incredible. But what's incredible about that is you made up your mind in advance. Mm -hmm. And then what you said, 59 calls later, you were determined to get that. There was no question in your mind about whether you were going to get that. You didn't know how you were going to get that. You knew just that you were going to get that because it was on your painted picture. Mm -hmm. So everybody listening to us right now, understand the difference that makes. Making up your mind in advance and then staying with it, staying with it, staying with it. Now that might be thought of as the definition of insanity, but of course, that's exactly what it is. He's nuts. And yeah. 
That's the genius behind what he's done. I think you have to be a little bit crazy to, to, to change the world, right? You know, it's that old Apple commercial. Those who think they're crazy enough to change the world might just do that. And so, you know, the painted picture, the company story that you call it, I created that because of the e-myth. So if there's anybody I can give back to, if anyone would like to see a painted picture and see ours, they could follow me on Instagram at Brian Scudamore. I'm happy to send them a painted picture if they ask. But having a vision of where you're going and the key you said, which I totally agree with, don't worry about how to get there. Just know where you're going. Then the rest will come with uh, directions and, and paths towards your vision. That's really, really important to all of you. Understand when Brian says, don't worry about how you're going to get there. Just know where you're going and it will come to you. And it will come to you. It absolutely will. And that's the genius underlying radical you. Not my genius, it's genius. Mm -hmm. When it became absolutely obvious to me, Brian, that every single human being, what I call a company of one, understand that every human being on the planet is a company of one, an economy of one. And the vast majority of them haven't a clue how to go beyond where they are to get something that they never even imagined they could get. We said, that's got to be possible for everyone. And we have got to create the medium through which that's possible and mm -hmm. made to happen. And that was the, you might say, the, 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 the inspiration or our painted picture behind Radical U. Radical U is an online curriculum to take every single human being from a company of one to a company of 1,000, Brian, just like you've done, through what we call the eightfold path, which is the dream, the vision, the purpose, the mission, the job, the practice, the business, the enterprise. A totally turnkey methodology that we bring to everyone in the world for $479.40 a year, the only school of its kind. Every week you go online to take your new lesson and then go back and apply it. So it's all about imagination and then innovation and then inspiration. You might say passion, integrity, professionalism, <laughs> and empathy. You might say pipe is alive and well at Radical U. And your inspiration, your inspiration, Brian, tells every single person who's listening to us that it's not only possible, it's absolutely essential because it is transformation that will occur in the world. Absolutely stunning. I just love your story. And I love the fact that you've actually done it. So I want to talk about O2E with the time that we have left. And I think we have just a few minutes left. Great. O2E, you went beyond junk and you're now in four new companies just like junk, but you're doing four different things and will be doing many other new things in the form of home services. Tell everybody what you've done. Well, one day years ago when we were running... 1-800-GOT-JUNK and we were about 100 million in revenue, we sat down and we said, what, what are we really doing here? This isn't about junk removal. We all knew that. But what were we doing? And we said, we are making the ordinary business of junk removal exceptional. And that was it. And we came up with that statement and we realized that the power behind that vision and that mission of what we were about, our purpose was so clear because it was the challenge of taking something so ordinary, ordinary people, an ordinary idea, and making it all exceptional through customer experience and so on. And so years later, 22 years later, in fact, I was a, a customer looking to have my house painted. And I came across this business. I was looking to have my house painted and three different people came by to give me estimates. The first two, cigarettes hanging out of their mouth, they showed up late. They were exactly what I expected in a painting company. But the third was unexpected. A guy named Jim Bodden who came in with a company with clean, shiny vans, 
He was uniformed. He had his iPad. He was all ready to go. And he said, will me paint your home and agree on painting day? We will have it done in a day. And I didn't think it was possible, but I hired him. I was so impressed. He did it in a day. I was blown away. I said, have you looked at franchising the company? He said, yes, it doesn't work. It's not franchisable. I said, I disagree. I bet I can help. Let's have a beer. And I bought the company. And the rest is history. We've got over 40 franchise partners painting homes in a day, wowing customers. But the commonality between any of our businesses, we then discovered was making the ordinary business of painting exceptional. Painting someone's home in a day, it's not rocket science. Everyone knows you can paint one room in a day with one person. Why not put one or two people in every room and get it all done at once? No compromise on quality. It's, it's remarkable. And so how do we make the ordinary business of moving exceptional? How do we make the ordinary business of window washing, gutter cleaning exceptional? That's our mission. What is brand number five? I have no idea. We're so busy. We got our hands full. But what I can tell you is brand number five will be making the X business, ordinary business of X exceptional. And so will number six and number seven. And that's our formula. And we're sticking to it. That's wonderful. So, Brian, um, I'm thrilled, beyond thrilled, that you've come here and joined us today. Um, I don't think there are any more questions that folks who are listening to us have. Great. It always astonishes me that there <laughs> aren't, because the core genius underlying what you've done is your incessant curiosity. Um, you're curious about everything. So how did that work? So why did that work? So why didn't that work? So why did we fail? So what could we have done differently? You're constantly reviewing and renewing your passion, your integrity, your professionalism, and your empathy for astonishing results and realizing that anything is possible as you put your heart and your mind to it. So I wanna thank you, Brian. I wanna thank you for being here. I want to tell you again about Radical You, and I want you to also perhaps um, reach out to everybody you know and tell us, tell them to join us as students in the most extraordinary school in the world, because it's not about simply learning. It's about learning and doing. It's about creating. We're awakening the creator within. We're awakening the entrepreneur within. We're awakening the Brian Scudamore within. You've heard him. You've seen him. You'll hear him again. And he'll share more with us soon in the future. Brian, thank you so much. I love you, you and I love what you do. Awesome. Well, thank you. You're a great friend, mentor, teacher, and a huge inspiration to many. So thank you again, Michael. My delight, Brian. Thanks. So folks, you heard it. You've seen it. You can believe it. He's doing it taking ordinary companies just like yours and turning them into exceptional companies beyond belief. The lessons he's learned from every extraordinary franchisor that he's applied to the development of the systems through which he's, in, he's been capable of producing stunning results for everyone who is attracted to him his customers, his employees, his franchise partners, everyone. That's the joy that you can experience as you awaken the entrepreneur within you. I want to thank you. Come back and see us soon. This is Mike Lee Gerber signing off from Carlsbad, California. Bye-bye.